name is T. Sher Singh. Today is June the 11th, 2014. I was in Toronto. I had uh, just finished law school in a year earlier and had just completed my one year, 12 months of articles uh, with a firm called McCarthy and McCarthy. And uh, 3rd of June, I think it was a Monday, which was my last day, I had gone to the office to, to clear up my office. And, uh, and the next day, I think, the front page news was, uh, I woke up and saw the paper and it was uh, the screaming news that the, the Warsaw had been attacked. It, um, it turned, my, turned my world upside down. Uh, both internally and externally. Internally in that, um, you know, there was this onslaught that began on the 4th of June and carried on every day uh, with six in the news and of course the uh, language coming from India escalating by the hour that they were militants, they were terrorists, they were fundamentalists, etc., etc. And, and the propaganda and the misinformation was relentless. And here I was about to start my career. I had finished my articles. I had a few months break and then I was going to do seven months of uh, bar admission courses and then be sworn in as a lawyer. And to complicate matters, I was going to be the first Sikh, practicing Sikh, first turban lawyer in the country. And I thought, what is it going to do to my um, image in the community? Uh, you know, how will clients react to me? How will law firms react to me? How will judges react to me? I had chosen to be a litigation lawyer, which meant I was at the mercy of, of judges. I couldn't sit in an office and do paperwork. I, I had to interact with people and I had to depend on other people making decisions. And I worried as to what it would do to me. And, uh, and that was a very, uh, 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 overpowering, overwhelming concern I had and on top of that publicly it, uh, it uh, changed my life in that there were no institutions in the community, nobody spoke for us, that we had no spokesman and then there were some educated among the community who were somehow taken uh, by the propaganda from India and started self-criticizing, criticizing the community and, and backing Indira Gandhi's efforts, etc. And I had a lot of pressure from those in the community who saw me as a new lawyer, even though I had, hadn't been sworn as such. They wanted me to step forward, to move forward and become the spokesperson. And, um, and I was very much an introvert still am, contrary to my public persona, uh, and was afraid to, to come out and, and, and be a spokesperson. And yet the role I had taken on as a lawyer uh, demanded that I be willing to do so. And, and I had a bit, bit of a fearlessness in that being a lawyer, I knew what my rights were, you know, how far I could go and, and, and be able to exercise uh, my rights and freedoms in speaking out freedom of expression and all of that. So there were these conflicting uh, things that uh, suddenly turned my life upside down. Mm -hmm. Well, immediately within days began an onslaught of misinformation. Some initially in the media being fed from India, such as the within days uh, news was being leaked out, which we knew to be false but later on confirmed to be false, coming from Indian government spokesmen that naked women had been found within the, the bar sahab. They were said in the Harmandar sahab. And horrendous, horrendous stories. That coupled with other, you know, exaggerated uh, half-truths, etc., etc. Um, that got further complicated in that within a few weeks, we started getting unsolicited VHS tapes in the mail, uh, you know, in our names with a stamp on the cover from the Indian 
consulate or the high commission offices. Um, and these were mass mailings done to prominent, well-known Sikhs, to prominent non-Sikh Indians, um, to the entire media, all the outlets, to all the members of parliament, to congressmen, to, to uh, uh, senators in the US, etc. There was a mass mailing. And we found out subsequently it was being organized by a um, PR agency that had uh, been hired by the Indians based in Switzerland and you know with a massive budget and this was this arrived in our mailboxes unsolicited with our names and addresses etc my you know so many of my friends called me and, and mentioned they had received them um, uh, with, with propaganda stuff like that and what was marvelous was that how quickly they were able to produce these you know, they couldn't possibly have started on them after the attack on the Golden Temple, etc. So we had to deal with that. Then very quickly the language escalated from militancy to terrorism and we were all being branded. Uh, nobody would speak back to answer them because uh, anybody who defended Sikhs was being described as being uh, a terrorist supporter or supporter of of uh, the militancy in India, etc. And uh, so I found myself in a in a dilemma in that uh, before my career began, was I going to associate myself with a very narrow ethnic cause or be the lawyer I wanted to be, which was a mainstream uh, a lawyer with a mainstream large firm doing real legal work, etc. And, and plus, uh, I didn't know what the exact facts were, what the information was. And being a lawyer, you didn't want to speak without knowing the facts. Uh, so there was pressure from behind saying, pushing me forward, saying, speak, why don't you? Are you chicken? Are you, are you betraying us? Are you letting us down? And on the other side saying, you know, what am I going to say? How can I say anything? Uh, even though I'm willing to be a spokesperson, etc. So, so all of those pressures uh, began, and they were they, they were relentless. The misinformation was relentless to the point that the community started staggering from it, and more and more people, people who were educated, who were in good positions, who were uh, uh, articulate, uh, became silent. Uh, they uh, would not identify themselves as Sikhs. Um, and within weeks, I discovered that some strange things were happening. The khanda disappeared from sight. So all of the Punjabi newspapers removed the khanda from their, uh, from their mastheads. Um, and I inquired and they said, well, you know, the Indians are saying that the khanda is a symbol of, of terrorism and therefore we are removing it, etc. So there was this... Um, uh, serious, serious um, introspection going on within the Sikh community and uh, and cowardly introspection. So it was in that whole milieu that I was mm -hmm. uh, uh, joining the legal profession. You know, there were a few Sikh professionals, all of them well placed in downtown Toronto, and we would socialize together. They were, you know, a few all young couples, and um, and we immediately got together uh, within days after uh, this whole scene began. Uh, the trigger being that we were concerned about the misinformation and what do we do? And I remember sitting down and chatting and uh, realizing that there was a desperate need for proper, correct. Uh, accurate information to be disseminated within the community. And one of the ideas we came up with was that we start some sort of a newsletter, some information sheet and circulate it, except where do we get the information? We started scouring the world press and every now and then I remember the most accurate stories we got was, I'm trying to remember the name of the magazine, a magazine from Singapore an English magazine, the equivalent of the Time magazine there, that seemed to be 
level-headed and, and telling the truth, etc. So we started clipping those, reproducing those, etc. I had a brain wave. I remembered that there was an English newspaper. Uh, there weren't too many in India. One of them uh, was the spokesman in, published from Delhi. And I phoned, I tracked down his phone number. I didn't know him, the editor, and asked him um, if um, he would send me a copy. Uh, we didn't have emails or fax machines then. Uh, so I asked him to um, uh, airmail, urgent airmail me a copy. Three days later I got it and it seemed to be telling us in English somewhat accurately what Sikhs saw was happening in India. We immediately printed 5,000 copies of that and distributed it in the local Gurdwaras and realized that they were lapped up very quickly and it had an impact when people started realizing that what they were reading in the mainstream media was not correct and, and wanted to know more. I had the fellow in Delhi uh, airmail me a, a copy of his latest issue. It was a weekly uh, newspaper he had um, on a weekly basis and we would immediately reproduce it. Within two or three weeks, uh, the fellow who was helping me, a uh, wonderful Sardar here, um, Raghbir Singh, who had a printing press of his own uh, and actually was the editor of the largest, the most, uh, the paper with the highest circulation, uh, Hindi newspaper in the, in the world outside India. He was a uh, editor, publisher of that Hindi newspaper and he uh, was quite taken by what was happening in in India and he offered to reprint these spokes, uh, spokesman copies. Within two or three weeks, we talked about the bad uh, quality, the poor quality of the language and I started rewriting some of the articles and he would retypeset them and set and, and set, redesign the paper, etc. And within four weeks, we realized that we could do more and more of it and and very quickly, it became 100% rewritten or newly written, freshly written, originally written newspaper of our own. I had the advantage that I had four months free between having completed my articles and waiting for my bar admission courses. And so I had all the time in the world. Uh, so I, you know, I had language skills, etc. So I started doing all of that. And within a few weeks, it became totally an indigenous newspaper and we had become quite adept at getting accurate stories and information from around the world. And the circulation shot up to about more than 10,000 and we started doing individual weekly mailings directly, copy, uh, single copies to different people who would send in their addresses etc. So that started happening very, very fast. At the same time, I was in contact with people in India asking for information, correct information, stuff that was not available in the media. And one of the people I approached was Sadar Sadhan Singh, who uh, many will know as the current editor-in-chief of the Sikh Review. He is an extraordinary man who was then recently retired as one of the top bureaucrats in the country. He had served as Indira Gandhi's um, special advisor to Assam, etc., etc. I knew him since childhood when he was the chief secretary in Bihar and uh, knew him as a man of integrity, an extremely articulate, decent, or sick man who I would respect more than anybody else I knew in the world. And I phoned him and I asked him and sounded him as to what was happening in India and what he told me was alarming. So that afternoon, I telexed um, a plane ticket to him. And, you know, within a day or so, he was on a plane. And he said, this is important and I, I am available. And he flew over. His daughter um, then and still does lived in uh, Buffalo. And he arrived in New York, New York to Buffalo, etc. I picked them up from Buffalo, brought him to Toronto, and arranged public meetings of Sikhs 
where he came, he answered our questions, he told us uh, to the best of his ability what he knew had been happening in India. And it was very, very powerful, very important for us. I remember, you know, having series of meetings, one of them uh, in, um, in, in Oakville, sitting in a park on a wonderful sunny late June, early July day with, you know, 120 people sitting on the grass and him talking to us, uh, almost a, a sermon on the mount kind of a scene. It, it was, uh, I knew then, you know, this was history in the making, what was happening. It was just, and he was a wonderful man, gutsy, etc. Word went out, he went to Montreal, went to other places to speak. Uh, all the contacts I had, I told them that you need to hear this man, you know, who had impeccable credibility and, uh, and got him into trouble, but he was fearless um, and, and went on and, and then headed back to India. Uh, fortunately, he was fine other than having some uh, bureaucratic uh, 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 troubles. The spokesman uh, became worldwide, uh, of worldwide circulation. We insisted on not having any ads uh, or uh, even, we didn't have the wherewithal to manage a subscription base. So we had no choice but to send it free. We didn't have time to apply for a reduced <laughs> postal rate. So we would put, you know, the full price and every Friday night, our eight families or so, children and all, would get together to some rehearsal part and then bring out these 10, soon to be 15,000 copies, fold each one of them individually and, uh, and put a stamp on them, put a dress on them and mail them by 2 o'clock next morning. And they were mailed around the world, etc. The, you know, the, these individuals, I didn't have any income then. I was a student <laughs> waiting to, for my bar ad exams. Um, and uh, the other ones uh, pitched in money and we had a few thousand dollars of kitty. But, you know, that money got used up in two issues. And we, uh, but money started pouring in. And next thing we knew in the mail, we were getting in checks from around the world. By within a few months, our and I, at the end of the year, our the, our annual budget was about eighty five thousand dollars, and not one cent went into anybody's personal pocket uh, or expense. Everything went for printing, uh, typesetting, or mailing the stamps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My team, who uh, helped. Uh, circulate this uh, newspaper, etc., uh, had imposed one condition on me. Uh, they did not want their names to be revealed because they were all professionals. I was a lawyer and not afraid to go out in public and say, yeah, I'm doing this. They were not <laughs> uh, as uh, willing to have their names. They, they were afraid um, uh, of, uh, of um, fallout from India. Um, I sympathize with them because I had the luxury of, of not having to worry about Indians because all of my family was here. I didn't need to go to India. They had relatives in, in India and they worried as to their ability to go back and what exposure they had. Etc. And I respected that and continue to do so till today that I have I've kept their name out of it, etc. The newspaper ultimately a year and a half later I couldn't continue. We killed it. A um, number of people wanted to take it over. People offered large amounts of money to, to purchase it from us and we said no because it had gained incredible uh, uh, credibility around the world as, as at times being the only source of correct information and we were afraid that if, some, it, went, if it went to the wrong hands, um, uh, uh, misinformation could be fed to the community and be swallowed as the truth. We were offered a lot of money for uh, purchasing and, and we knew that some of those sources were from within the Indian intelligence. Uh, 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 we nevertheless closed it down, killed the newspaper and the very next week one issue appeared and we, we checked it out and found somebody who had learned that we had closed it down and was, was running with it and we immediately um, uh, hired 
uh, a law firm <laughs> served a notice and instantly killed that attempt uh, because we were afraid that the, it had become such a powerful media that uh, it could be very easily uh, misused. When we killed it, um, you know, uh, we had hate mail from six from around the world. I still have copies of some of those letters um, accusing us of having sold our souls, that we, we had somehow succumbed to pressure from the Indians that killed the newspaper. Um, and, uh, you know, it was difficult to convey to the community around the world that why we had to do it. We had limited resources. We had nobody to, to take over the, the newspaper and um, uh, nobody reliable to, to, to continue the uh, thing. So we felt uh, rightly or wrongly to, better to kill it than to let it carry on. Being the first Sikh lawyer and for many reasons that I've already explained, being one of the very few and sometimes the only person willing to talk to the media um, or to government uh, people who were looking for, for information, um, uh, I was often approached by, by people from various levels of the government, including the CSIS, which is our equivalent of the CIA and the FBI, and of course the RCMP, uh, the local police people. So they often turned up at my law office asking uh, uh, if they could sit down with me and, and canvas certain things. One day, uh, two of them turned up, one a member of the CSIS, uh, that's the Canadian Security and Investigation Service or something or the other, CSIS, and, um, and the other one from the RCMP. And the two of them sat in my office and uh, asked why so many Sikh terrorist cells were popping up across Canada. And I, you know, was, my jaw dropped and I said, yeah, which ones? And so uh, one of them picked up his briefcase, put it in his lap, opened it and pulled out the Nishan Sab, the Sikh flag, the Sikh standard. And he looked at me and he said, this is flying over a dozen different places in Toronto alone. And I explained to him that this was the Sikh religious flag. It was the Sikh standard which was, you know, mandatorily flown outside every Sikh place of worship, outside every Gurdwara to, to tell the world this was a Sikh place of worship. And their jaws dropped, and they, it was news for them. They said the Indians have told us, and they pulled out a communique, not from the Indian consulate, not from the Indian um, High Commission, but from the Defense Ministry in India that they had sent inquiries to, and that communique told them that this flag was a sign, uh, it was a mark of, of, of a, a terrorist cell, etc. So I cleared that up for them. Then they asked me uh, about the Khanda, which they claimed uh, was also um, a, a terrorist symbol. They were had been told they had been told that anybody who refused to clip his beard or insisted on in having a turban and a flowing beard was a terrorist and needed to be uh, kept an eagle eye on, etc. And I explained to them that though my beard is dressed up, it is not cleared. And if, if that was the definition, I was a terrorist, etc. And, you know, and so I realized then, and they realized then, of how much, um, how little they knew about Sikhs and how uh, much misinformation they were getting. One of the challenges that I had while I was getting involved in all of this um, reluctantly and um, um, not voluntarily because I was being pulled from every direction um, was my concern that the Khanda had disappeared uh, from all mastheads of, of Sikh newspapers, etc., and that we were too much on the defensive, etc. Uh, I started planning on, on addressing that and the next event few months later, uh, one of the first ones that we did in the community um, as, a, as an event to bring the community together, uh, it, this was one of the earliest um, uh, forms, the antecedent of what later on became 
the Centennial Foundation and the annual Visaki dinner and the Spinning Wheel Film Festival and of course the Seek Sheik and all that stuff. So the, one of the first events that we did, we spent a lot of money in our materials and uh, created a very uh, flashy, loud um, cover of our materials. And one of them was that it was solid, glossy black with nothing written on it except a khanda in the middle in gold. And that was the turning point. We made it so um, classy and, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, appealing that, uh, and it was, you know, the event was held in the Prince Hotel, the fanciest hotel in Toronto at that particular time. We charged then $150 an hour, a uh, plate, uh, etc. And so that created a bit of a comfort within the community that it was okay to use the, uh, the, the kanda, particularly where we had cabinet ministers from Ottawa turning up to the event, etc., etc. So we had this, this challenge that our own government in India was actively uh, spreading the information, labeling us uh, uh, with, with these uh, horrible uh, 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 labels, and uh, and we had to fight them. We had to fight the local media, which was swallowing it hook, line, and sinker. We were we were dealing with uh, people within our community who either were too shy of uh, of, of looking at the facts, were too willing to uh, swallow what was, was uh, coming as propaganda from India, etc., and had to struggle with them. I mean, there was one within our group that I told you, uh, one day turned up in the media and started speaking against uh, Sikhs and saying what happened in Amritsar was fine. And, uh, and you know, and, and he was a, a vice president of a leading bank in, in Toronto. Uh, what do we do? Uh, you know, and we were educated, articulate people. Uh, uh, so we tried to talk to him and he just sort of scolded us. So we immediately initiated a boycott of him. So one of our friends within our own immediate family, for the next five years, we had no social interaction with him. We never invited him, would not go to his place, etc. It was the only thing we could do as civilized people. I was very much entrenched in Toronto um, when suddenly this news came in of the pogroms. And, um, uh, and that, uh, we barely got over June and, and this thing came along. Um, hadn't got over because the onslaught had continued and there was hyperactivity, nevertheless, um, this um, new phase came along. Uh, our immediate response was to uh, start collecting money and we knew winter was coming. Uh, so collecting blankets, collecting clothes, etc., for the uh, victims and the survivors in, in Delhi and uh, had set up several collection points in Toronto and very quickly had collected a pile of money and mountains of clothes and blankets and stuff like that. Uh, I checked up with a number of airlines who flew to India and had made arrangements uh, for free transportation of all of this stuff. And as soon as we were off and running, the Indian government announced that they would not allow any shipments to be unloaded in India because they said we do not need any help. We are taking care of our people and all of them are well taken care of and no aid from abroad would be permitted. So we were not able to send that. Then they started demanding that all funds to be sent to India be given to them and they would forward them. We of course knew that that 
was not the right route because money would never see the light of the day if handed over to them, as was the case. They, they started a fund uh, on their own saying, here is a fund bank account and many people poured in money into those accounts and those monies were never accounted for ever. Um, the monies we had then uh, collected sort of dried up in that we discouraged people from giving money. We didn't know what to do with the money and whatever money was collected was then sent off uh, to help uh, whatever uh, 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 routes we had of, of sending money to India. Um, one of the things we started um, doing in the spokesman is encouraging Sikhs to not to help India financially in any way. And one of the routes we took was that we put a full-size banner ad on the front page of our newspaper uh, asking people not to fly Air India. And uh, because the major portion of the clientele that Air India had uh, coming from abroad, therefore a major source of the income of Sikhs. And we, we laid out our reasons. We said, if you support this Indian government-owned airline, you're giving them money. You're giving them money that is being used to kill our people, uh, etc. So, uh, so why do that? And then we raised another issue. And we said, you remember, you're dealing with Indians who have no um, adherence to ethics or values. And there is so much going on in India. There's so many disgruntled people who have been oppressed by the Indians. Uh, sooner or later, somebody is going to blow up an Air India plane, and then they're going to blame Sikhs, etc. And more importantly, why would you want to fly on a plane and endanger your life by, by, with that risk, etc. And lo and behold, a few months later, um, it actually happened. And so it is uh, surreal to go through those old copies which predate the, the, uh, the, newspaper, uh, the uh, uh, 1985 uh, Air India bombing uh, uh, and, uh, and talk so openly about the possibility of that happening and, and, uh, and, and the dangers of supporting Air India, etc., etc. The Indian government was very active. In fact, they sent a plane load of Indian intelligence operatives. They convinced the RCMP that they, there was a lot of uh, terrorist activity being fomented in, in Canada uh, and therefore they needed to uh, monitor it. The problems that the Canadians had was that right across the board, no police force, neither the RCMP nor the CSIS nor the Canadian military had a single Punjabi speaking person. Uh, on, in their employ. Uh, and this sadly, even though Sikhs have been living in, in Canada for a century, uh, so that was one of the, the, the sad situations that Canada was in. In fact, much of the West was in. And uh, so the Indians took advantage of that and said, we will send you Punjabi-speaking operatives who would assist you, and, and the Canadian authorities welcomed them. It is after they arrived here that the Canadians started realizing that they had asked for trouble and, and they were getting more uh, trouble than they had bargained for. And these people started tapping for phones left and right, um, taking advantage, spreading misinformation. And it is that time that I was told by many people in the government and certainly in the media that they knew how much mischief the Indians were doing here. Um, uh, and, and the Indian operatives had free reign, you know, because they claimed that uh, they needed to do this. Indeed, the Canadians didn't have uh, the wherewithal to, to uh, tap into communications within the community, and therefore, through default, they had to rely on these guys who then were openly doing badmashi here, etc. And it is around that time that the that the Air India operation began. Uh, there were a lot of uh, attempts uh, uh, that fomented in Europe where RCMP and um, uh, uh, MI5 uh, American uh, operatives got together with the plan 
to uh, bomb uh, uh, an Air India plane and blame it on uh, Sikhs and, and the plan was to explode it while it was on a tarmac with nobody on it and then blame uh, Sikh terrorists on that. The insurance would take care of the plane, nobody would be hurt and in one fell swoop, you know, Sikh activism would be dealt with. They, they carried out that operation but did it masterfully. There was something went wrong and that was that the plane was delayed and, the, and it blew up in, in mid-air as opposed to what was planned um, uh, as, as blowing up on, on the London on uh, airport tarmac and, uh, and they masterfully uh, uh, killed any credibility that Sikh activists had around the world who were decrying the human rights violations in India, etc., etc. All of that was, was happening around the same time, you know, within, within months, within, you know, uh, seven months or, or, or what, after uh, November 1984, that happened in 85. So. I was going to finish my article, then I was going to have a few months uh, free, and I was trying to see what I would do during those four months. Um, you know, I wanted to travel, I wanted to do a few things. And one, and I had one idea I wanted to, I had a photographer friend and I thought one of the projects I would like to do, and I had formulated it at the end of 83, was go to India and see if I could do a, a book on Indira Gandhi. And I wanted to do a coffee table book with, based on just photographs. And the idea was that if I could get an in somehow and shadow her for a week with a photographer and do a book on her. And this guy in the consulate, he was one of the consuls, uh, latched on to that idea and put in a request to the PMO. And the whole thing was in the works. So as June is approaching, my plans are that soon as I finish my articles, my photographer friend and I are going to go off to India and, this, and spend at least a week, if not more, shadowing Indira Gandhi in, in doing a book, in, uh, doing a, book, a coffee table book on her. That was the background. There was no animosity between Sikhs and Indians. I had no inkling. I had never heard of Bindrawala. Bindrawala, the first time I heard the name was a week after the attack on the Golden Temple. I had never heard the name before. Okay, I know some people knew about it, those people who were familiar with Punjab politics, I was not, etc. So, in answer to your question as to how June 84 transformed uh, you know, my life, it was that wall that before that, not just me, but all Sikhs, we were very, very Indian, very much part of, of the whole scene, etc. And there was absolutely no reason other than the immediate need for Indira Gandhi to consolidate her, her, her electoral chances that she did that. And sure, there were issues going on in India, etc., etc. But certainly six across the board did not feel any animosity with, against Hindus, against Indians, against the Congress party, against Indira Gandhi, whatsoever. I mean, and that, that plan alone of what I was going to do with my time post-June indicates of how innocent our, our, our life was heading in, in that direction and it got, got turned upside down, etc. So, you know, the... Indian intelligence operatives remained in, uh, active. The people I'm talking about remained on the job in disrupting the Sikh community post June 1984, in creating violence in the protests that Sikhs were doing out on the streets and outside the consulate. And, and you know, and I don't want to go too much in detail about the evidence that I have, 
where clearly the violence that erupted in many of these places was actually instigated by the Indian uh, uh, intelligence operatives, who then continued to stay on and were directly involved in the bombing of the Air India flight. Okay. It's not a theory. People within the Canadian intelligence community, as well as uh, the Canadian media, very senior people, as well as people working within the consulate, confirmed to me directly that they too knew it as truth, that it was the Indian government uh, hand in the bombing itself. But they also all confirmed, particularly the media and the Canadian government uh, uh, people, that their hands were tight. There was too much pressure from the Indian government on the Canadian government to, to cooperate. And, and even when the bombing of the Air India happened, they could not um, uh, do too much in bringing out the truth and accepting the, the, the propaganda, etc., etc. So, so the juxtaposition of what happened before June and what came after that is, is all uh, highlighted by how India took, you know, not only what India did in June 1984, but then how it handled. And, and their challenge was that the Sikhs living abroad were the secret weapon that Sikhs had. It was very easy for them to silence Sikhs in India through terrorizing the Sikh populace through not only June 1984, but later on November 1984. But they could not silence us. So the, the more mischief they did in India, the more human rights violations they did in India, the louder we became. And the louder we became, the more they said we are the source of, of terrorism, being in Canada, being in the US, being in England, where in fact all we were doing is exercising our democratic rights, our, our freedom of expression, our freedom of press, something that we were so, was so cherished in, in these free societies, etc. And, uh, and, and that is, has been our, our difficulty our challenge and it's been good for us. I want to then move on to saying that um, um, it, from a social engineering perspective, you know, uh, if 1984 had not happened, uh, we would have remained a very ordinary uh, community moving along steadily. We, we do well wherever we go. We are nation builders, but it, there would have been a steady group improvement in the graph. Um, the fact that 1984 happened is the fact that we had to deal with these massive challenges uh, made us a better community and a bigger community and a more successful community. The fact people may ask how come uh, a minority like, like the Sikh community in Canada has fared so well uh, in politics, in you know, are so much a part of uh, the Western corporate scene, Western um, uh, uh, the part of the the corridors of power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is because they have been taught to fend for themselves. That uh, uh, you know, our challenge has always been that we've been a minority uh, with a majority complex. We uh, tend to behave like a majority and feel we don't need to worry about our rights, everything is taken care of. We have the swagger and the arrogance that goes with being a majority, except we were never a majority, we've always been a minority. And, but we behaved like a majority. So that, you know, sort of um, uh, took us by surprise when we realized that suddenly that didn't work for us. We needed to uh, 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 look after our, our needs and slowly but steadily, we have started learning that the Indians will not look after us. Our mothership is cut off from us. We are adrift and we need to look after our own needs. If we don't, uh, nobody else will. Hence, we have given birth to institutions. like Now we are becoming a, a, a mature community, looking after our interests. Um, uh, gradually, we are understanding the need for our own media, for our own spokespeople, for our own 
advocates uh, for our own institutions, possibly our own schools and so on and so forth. And, uh, and I think that is a direct result. So we, we, we become a stronger community. Uh, we would not have been but for 1984. So uh, the Indians uh, unwittingly have uh, uh, empowered us and ultimately I think that the chickens will come home to roost and I think they'll have to deal with that.